Okay, to... Hello, everybody tuning in. We are live with our second Leapfroggers Live interview with the fantastic Nina Vaca from Pinnacle Group. Thank you so much for joining me, Nina. Thanks for having me, Nolwyn. I'm super excited. Yeah, this is going to be great. So um, you are mentioned in Leapfrog, which is going to be released on the 28th of August, uh, written by the CEO of Brava, Natalie Molina Nino. I am part of the Leapfrog team working on the launch. And uh, you're mentioned in hack number 49, which is cash in on your woman card, or number nine, which is cash in on your woman card, and number 49, which is catch a whale. So um, for those of us in the audience who aren't yet acquainted with Leapfrog and Pinnacle Group, could you go ahead and say a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Um, my name is Nina Vaca. I'm Chief Executive Officer of Pinnacle Group, proud to be one of the fastest growing women-owned businesses in America. I have to tell you, I'm super excited about being in Natalie's book. I think it's a it's in a wonderful handbook for women all over that are trying to start businesses, and I'm really proud to be part of it. The reason I said yes is because we need more women running businesses of scale. And if my advice or my hack, hack number 49, could be helpful in any way, then I'm happy to do my part. Yeah, absolutely. And we're super happy to have you here talking to us today. So I guess to my first question would be, Leapfrog talks about Pinnacle Group's expansion and how it's partly attributed to your relationship you have with your customers and your clients. How did you kind of grow this relationship and how have you made yourself really invaluable to the people that you work with and your clients? Sure. So my hack is hack number 49. It's called catching a whale. And so let me yeah. give you some context. When I first started my business, well, again, what a good entrepreneur entrepreneur does is it finds a need in a marketplace and it fills it. And for me, that need was IT talent to large Fortune 500 companies. But let me take a step back. Um, yeah. In the United States, there are over 10.6 million women-owned businesses in this country that are contributing over a trillion dollars to the American economy. Yeah, wow. yeah. Yet under 2% are under a million dollars. And so ladies or women, we have no problem starting businesses. We can start those businesses where the challenges really belong, where the challenges really are, are in scaling those businesses. And so I had a decision on who my customers, our customers would be. I decided not to do business with the federal government, not to start a company that's B2C. I decided to start B2B and directly do business with the Fortune 500 industry leaders um, and so that has served me well. And the reason my hack is catch a whale is because I think corporate America and large industry leaders can have a tremendous value and contribution to women owned businesses. Why? Because they spend billions of dollars in their supply chain. <laughs> so it made perfect sense. And so if we can catch a whale, we can eat for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so when it comes to that kind of fast growth, like when you do catch your whale and that can kind of take off, uh, that can be overwhelming if you don't have preparation. Can you run through any tips that you have to prepare for that kind of expansion? Sure. Okay. First and foremost, I, I think that um, growth can sound very positive, but I like to, I like to focus on intelligent growth because sometimes growth can kill you. And in running a business, financial discipline and financial integrity run supreme. So when you're growing a business and you're growing a business of scale, making sure that you have the financial discipline to absorb that growth um, is really, I, like I said, it, 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 it is one of the most important things to think about is making sure that you can swallow that whale. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. And making sure that um, yeah, that you're really ready to absorb that kind of thing is a good point. Um, what do you think would be, so, and you also mentioned in the book that you look for clients who share your lifelong commitment to bettering the community. How did you get involved in those community initiatives and kind of start a partnership like the one you had that you currently have with at and Sure. So, um, to pick on some customers, I, I believe that once you're doing business, our relationship with our customers is based on two critical factors. Number one, you've just got to deliver. I mean, you've got to be really mm -hmm. good at what you 
to, and you have, those are table stakes. You have to deliver your product, your service. You have to be able to deliver, anticipate their needs. But the second mm -hmm. thing is mirror their values. Each corporation has mm -hmm. values and things that they believe in, things that they want to contribute to. And so by doing those two things, not just focusing on being a supplier and delivering mm -hmm. your product or service, but focusing on being a partner and mirroring in those values. I was with a customer earlier today, lending my personal leadership, being engaged and contributing on something they're really passionate about. Then they become partners. They're not mm -hmm. just customers. You're not just a supplier. You become invaluable with them. And I'm happy you mentioned AT&T because they're a perfect example of that. It was AT&T that got me involved in the mayor's internship program years ago. And mm -hmm. today it rains interns at Pinnacle every year through the mayor's internship program. It yeah, was yeah. they who got me involved in the Peace Through Business program, which was the very first time I started doing work with women in Rwanda and Afghanistan and working with Laura Bush and getting involved in and in really having some some knowledge about women across the world. And so I think those I think that particular community value prepared me and in many ways springboarded me to be named a presidential ambassador in 2014 of global entrepreneurship, where I spent a lot of time going to five different continents and inspiring female entrepreneurs. Yeah, and I think that, that yeah, um, um, if we mentioned like the just women, I think that's a great aspect in finding companies that you really have values with and growing together. Like you mentioned, like the idea of a partnership, just not them being a client. The partnership aspect is super important. It's and so critical, so critical because it makes you stickier, right? Because mm -hmm. you're, you're not just a supplier. And I mean, let's be honest, there is a ton of consolidation that happens. There's a lot of cutting that happens in the supply base, you know, in our personal business, you know, you were one of 20, 30 suppliers that provide that good and service. And so you have to find ways to make your customer a partner and not just a customer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you also are quoted in your book uh, as saying to take your earnings and put them back into a business. Um, for a leapfrogger, a lot of times that's only year one or two in her business, and she's not yet earning enough to then reinvest into her company and grow. Do you have any specific like mini hacks or advice for how she can use the small resources that she has in those first two years to then reach a point where she's able to really reinvest and grow? Sure. So you said the word resources, and to me, that's analogous for relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I always tell people, make deposits every single day in the bank of relationships, right? That's before she needs help year one or year two in her business, she should be making just as a general person deposits in the bank of relationships. Those become resources and those become invaluable to your business a piece of advice, um, mentors. I'll give you an example. Yes. Corporations. I'll give you an example. When we were just one or two or three years old, we couldn't go to these conferences. We couldn't mm -hmm. afford the $700 registration to the WeBank conference. By the way, WeBank is the Women Business Enterprise National Council. It has 14 yes. regional partners across the United States. Their sole mission is one thing is to connect women-owned businesses with corporations and industry leaders. And so we couldn't even afford to go to the big gala, to go to the big conference, to buy the table, to get lots of badges. And it was corporations that invited me in, right? So building, <laughs> making deposits in the bank of relationships, get was we were able to get to afford a seat at the table, a literal seat at the table. But it, yeah. could, be, it could be a whole, that's just one example. My point mm -hmm. is, through your relationships and your resources, you could leverage things that financially you may not even be able to afford. Yeah. So when it comes to, like you mentioned, not being able to afford those $700 tickets to conferences, and even sometimes they can go as high as thousands of dollars just to get in. And then you also have to pay for your travel and your hotel and everything. Where do people, where would you think people could go to meet someone who kind of get them into that? Like where do those, Time, where do those invites kind of, where did they come from? So back on that example for me, um, mm -hmm. the Women's Business Council Southwest is one of the 14 um, RPOs, they call them, right? Um, mm -hmm. There are different women's groups, whether it's the Women's Presidents Organization out of New York, whether it's NABU, whether it's 
uh, women, the Women's Business Enterprise National Council or their local affiliates. So I started getting involved again locally because anything that happens nationally, there is a local opportunity to get engaged. And that's mm -hmm. where I started meeting mentors. That's where I started meeting sponsors, right? And we all know the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. And so that's where I started really meeting people that wanted to see me succeed. I give that piece of advice to so many people. It sounds so simplistic to surround yourself by people that truly want to see you succeed. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds very simple, but for me, it's been finding these ecosystems of women's groups where we all want the same thing. And it's beautiful when you support each other and they could be really inspirational because you see women that look like you, right? And that are mm -hmm. doing great things and they can become great advisors and great ambassadors for your success. Yeah, and you had just mentioned that um, the difference between mentors and sponsors. And I think for someone who's really just getting into the to the entrepreneurship game and who wants to learn as much as possible, what would you say is the difference between those two things? Is there something that, is there one that you think would be more better for them to focus on, whether it's mentor or sponsorship, at different levels of their entrepreneurship journey? Well, ultimately you want both. Uh, a mentor is someone who's willing to give you a piece of their time, some good advice. Maybe you have a situation and you want uh, good advice on how to handle that situation. A mentor in the beginning is just someone to take my call. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> eventually you want to get to a sponsor. And what a sponsor is, is someone who absolutely has put their own personal capital and social capital in your success. Because a lot of the time, um, people are making decisions about you, whether it's to give you a contract, whether it's to elect you in a role, whether it's to invite you in a club when you're not in the room. And so you want that sponsor, that person that knows you and cares deeply about your success, that's willing to put their social capital and willing to put their neck on the line for you. And that is a beautiful thing. And it takes, yeah. time. It takes time to earn sponsors, mm -hmm. by the way. And we yeah. have... I mean, you can't walk up to someone and say, hey, can you be my sponsor? Because you're yeah. asking people to put their social capital in you. And mm -hmm. those, um, for me, sponsors are earned and they're earned through consistent behavior. And when people see you and they know that you're serious about what you're doing, that you're true of heart, that you're consistent in your actions, um, you're going to start to become a bit of a magnet and attract mentors and sponsors. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it would be not only, like you mentioned, getting involved in your local community, finding mentors, finding sponsors, but also being persistent in terms of not letting the fact that you're just starting out be a hindrance to you, but really staying on and keeping on. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I think um, when it comes to your personal hacks and what you'd recommend to inspiring entrepreneurs, what would be your own personal hack? that you think, or a couple different hacks that you have for aspiring women entrepreneurs who are just getting started? So that's a good question. You know, we're, we're talking about business right now and you just asked me a personal hack and there's a personal hack or, a, or really maybe not a hack, but a saying I have in life. And that is, you know, as women, we can have it all, but we just can't do it all. You're talking to someone who has had four children. <laughs> You're talking to someone who has built a company. Yeah. You're talking to someone who has tried to be a lot of things, you know, be involved in your community, be there for your customers, be there for your employees, be there for your children, be there for your husband, be there for ever. And so I always say you can have it all, but you just can't do it all. It's okay to ask for help. It is mm -hmm. okay to have a tribe. It's okay. In fact, it's actually essential. You know, they say that every woman has her tribe that inspires her in different areas of her life. And that is my personal hack. My personal hack is I stand on the shoulders firmly of so many people and the, who love me, who care about me, who want to see me succeed. And it's taken me 22 years to build that tribe. But I'm telling you, that is the tribe that will help you and inspire you in your most darkest moments. Yeah. And what would you say would be the kind of key? How do you make sure that the people in your tribe are the people that are going to be with you? And how can an inspiring entrepreneur kind of differ from or differentiate from someone who's kind of with them for a short term and with them for a long term? Like, how can you really build a solid tribe that you know you can trust with, whether it's a big 
problem or a small project? Where do you kind of come to that? How do you get to that point? <laughs> you know, one of the things I realized most recently through a leadership program that I'm going through is that I have more years behind me than I do ahead of me. And mm -hmm. I am in the position of, I'm no longer looking for youth, but wisdom. And wisdom, right, even at a young age, you have to have judgment to surround yourself with people that want to see you succeed. I don't quite know how to teach this. Um, and, and sometimes we make our mistakes, right? We think someone is our friend and they may be not, but we have to have that talent to mm -hmm. look out and surround ourselves by people that truly want to see us succeed. And you'll find it, I promise, you'll feel it, you'll know. And um, because the more you, you'll, depending on the organizations you're involved in, the passions that you're, that you're trying to um, be engaged in, you, you just, you will know it. Every woman out there knows it. <laughs> they know yeah. there's two kinds of women out there, those who will help you and those who will not. And so, you know, it's interesting because Natalie Molina Nino is one of those people when mm -hmm. we first met, it was almost magical. I could tell instantly that this is a person who, who cares so much about women, even women she doesn't know. In fact, she's yeah. cared so much about women that she doesn't know that she is going to write a book to help and inspire hundreds of thousands and I hope even millions of women. And she mm -hmm. has gathered her tribe of people that are like-minded, but think about that. I have great respect for people that dedicate their lives to the advancement of others and don't mm -hmm. expect anything in return. And yes. Natalie is one of those people. And exactly why I, I agreed to be in this book, because we share that same value, that we want to mm -hmm. contribute in a meaningful and impactful way. And there's a lot of stories about women and, and th that are untold, a lot of challenges, a lot of stories a lot of hacks that we could use to help each other. But the whole goal of the book and the whole goal of my participation is to actually help women. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's one of the things is uh, why we're so happy to have the people who are mentioned in LeapFrog and uh, kind of like you as a founder, a CEO of such a big company that's doing such good and also that's being able to, we're able to bring that to these women that we don't know. And I think that idea of the same thing with LeapFrog is, we don't know how many people this is gonna help, but the fact that it's for someone that we aren't you know, in contact with is just as important as meeting people that we do know face to face. Um, and I think in addition to uh, the aspect of helping people that we don't know, what would you kind of with your, you have like a very busy schedule and there's a lot going on, how would you use your team to kind of help you support that? Where does your team come in when they, like, how would you advise an entrepreneur to try not to do it all? How would you kind of give them advice to delegate? Like, are there things that you think they should really focus on and then the other things they can delegate to another person? Right. So I, you know, again, these types of, of questions, the, the, the answer is always, it depends <laughs> because yeah, it's absolutely. Different. Yeah. Right. And I, I may not have I may have the right answer, the wrong answer, but God, I have an opinion. Yes, and my, opinions, my opinions are shaped in my own personal experience. And so I, I really feel like when you're first starting out of business, for me, at least, it was very mm -hmm. powerful to transfer from being in the business to working instead of working in the business to working on the business. Right. Mm -hmm. Because when you first start out, you need that contract. You're working in the business. You're the sales office. You're 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 wearing every single hat. You're head of human resources. Yeah. You're the CEO. You're head of sales. You're you're trying to do everything. And, to take, and, and that's what we do. Right. We don't have a big budget. We're starting out, you know, um, but I think it's important as we develop mm -hmm. to understand that and have the confidence to surround ourselves by really good people. Yes, and then yeah. let them do their job. And mm -hmm. I think that is a really important point for women entrepreneurs is to understand that they don't have to be the smartest person in the room and do everything. They have to surround themselves um, with, with really great talent that fill the gaps that they know that they need in their business to execute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and making sure that there's no burnout, you know, keeping a level playing field and not letting that affect you so much and having a team that's able to support you 
And like you said, like you'll know when you have that team and when everything's working so well and having that work for you. Um, do you have any obstacles that you think are that stuck out to you when you were in that stage of I need to switch from working in my business to working on my business? Was there a moment where you kind of had a hard time letting go of that and being like, I just want to like if it's, if it's going to be done, I might as well do it myself because then I know I've done it the right way that I want it. Is there a moment where you kind of had to let go and be like, it's OK, I can let someone do this. It'll be fine. Yes, I have some funny stories. I don't know that we could, I don't know that we have enough time to get into all those stories, but suffice to say, absolutely. Every entrepreneur mm -hmm. goes through that stage where they want to do everything themselves. Letting go for me was really, really hard. This is my baby, 22 mm -hmm. years, blood, sweat, and tears, mm -hmm. but it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And it's not just necessary when you're an entrepreneur, it's necessary when you're a leader. Right? Yes, absolutely. Even if you're working yeah. in corporate America, the ability to let go and to grow and nurture other leaders just comes with experience and wisdom. My role mm -hmm. is to my role today is to grow future leadership, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and and not to do everything, but to grow leaders, to build culture. And that, you know, and I'm really proud of that. By the way, Pinnacle Headquarters is 63% female executives and 40% minorities yeah. in our corporate headquarters. And that, that, you know, I am passionate about women. I'm a mm -hmm. passionate about inspiring them, growing them. I'm passionate about, I've helped women start businesses in different countries like Vietnam and Jordan. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I really put my money where my mouth is <laughs> in terms of inspiring other women and helping them grow. And of course, there's a thing that we can do in our community. And I, I love what you said. True leadership is about helping people you don't even know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, um, uh, we have actually a question right here in our comment section. And one of those questions is what specific advantages do women have as entrepreneurs? Cause I think a lot of people kind of focus on the struggle, which is definitely a real issue. And that's something that you kind of come up in with this, such like a male dominated field, but what advantages do you have as a woman entrepreneur? I love that question. I love that question because in that question um, you're realizing that the woe is me card is not the way to it's it, it's it, for me it's always been what is the asset that i have people ask me all the time what well, what is the disadvantage between you being a latina or you being in tech and i'm like what do you mean yeah, <laughs> i yeah. my my challengers my challenges were and are as difficult as so many other entrepreneurs that started with absolutely nothing but the, yeah. that's the right way to frame the issue is what are the advantages? And for me, it's an advantage to be a woman in the 21st century in the United States with the conversation mm -hmm. being so loud. For me, it's an advantage to be a Latina in IT. And so for me, the answer is in the question itself, the fact that, that we see and we look for advantages. Um, there are very few women who run businesses of scale. We know corporations that want to embrace that. We know that's a challenge. So it's an advantage to surround ourselves by people that are like-minded. And I, I bring up the Women's Business Council again, because where else could I meet corporations that want to do business with women-owned businesses? And so for yeah. me, I, I've never seen me being a minority or me being a female as a disadvantage. I have to change my, I have to adjust my thinking and say, this is an asset. Being the only person in the room gives me an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn that into being the only person in the room into being many of us in the room. And so I love the question in and of itself. And I think there are true advantages. Um, mm -hmm. And we need to build our own golf course. And I think that's what Natalie yes, is thinking, yeah, right? We need to, there are different advantages and, yeah. and we've got to figure out how to build our own tribe of women helping women. And it's not mm -hmm. going to happen in a tsunami. It's going to mm -hmm. happen one by one with every single woman doing their part and supporting each other. Yeah. And yeah, I think there's, I a, think similar, there's a similar. I love, I love, I love your point. Love your building point. Building our I think a lot of uh, when someone does ask about um, how a woman can kind of get in the door, it's like, well, I don't, I don't know how to do those things that are stereotypically so male oriented. So it's like, let's just build our own place to do that. And we can just do it ourselves. We don't need to go into a pre-existing 
uh, space there. We can just build our own space and go from there. I do, I really like that. Um, and I think we have a, like a similar question along the lines of um, millennials, like what um, superpowers is one of the commenters is using the word superpowers. Do they bring into the world, uh, into the workforce and into the world of entrepreneurship? What advantage do you have being a millennial, do you think? Oh, what I love about millennials is their diversity of thought. I mean, think mm. about that. I've been asked a lot, you know, we talk a lot about diversity, diversity, diversity. And to me, diversity isn't just gender. It isn't just color. Mm -hmm. It's diversity of thought. And again, that is that is an asset. I think millennials think differently. They act differently, I think, um, in just so, so many ways. And so I always like to say that life is about your perspective and how you view yourself, right? How you view mm -hmm. yourself is directly related to who you will become. So as a millennial, if or as a woman or as a minority, mm -hmm. whatever whatever the situation is, if you, you view yourself as a complete asset to whatever organization that you're going to contribute to, mm -hmm. that kind of changes things because you have a level of confidence. You know, are you walking in a room as a millennial saying, gosh, I'm only in my teens or 20s and I don't, I'm young, I may not have what it takes and you feel like you're like, and you don't have that personal confidence as opposed to if you walk in the room saying, yeah, you know, I'm a millennial and I represent a new way of thinking and I represent a way of thinking that people don't know. And when I open my mouth, they could learn from this generation yeah. that happens to be the largest generation that everybody wants. And so mm -hmm. I think that that's how I used to walk in the room way back when, when I was young. Like I said, I've got more years behind me than I do ahead of me. But <laughs> yourself as an as an asset and you have the confidence that what you bring to the table is different there's a lot of power in that yeah and i think that also directly relates to the idea of not seeing yourself um because you're a woman entrepreneur as being defined by your disadvantages being defined by your advantages and like the whole idea of mindset being super super important when you're just starting out um, yeah, definitely. So to anyone who's commenting down below, feel free to tag anyone that you think uh, would love to see this. Um, I think that one of our, I'd really liked your point about the mindset and the idea of differing ideas and having not only it be a diversity of color, of gender, but having it be a diversity of thought. Because like in our, uh, what we had mentioned before, but being able to have, be a leader is also being accepting to ideas different than your own and being able to bring that in and being a kind of surrender the idea that you have the best way to do it, for sure. Um, do you think the idea of leapfrogging, which is kind of the basis of leapfrog, um, do you think finding hacks and the idea of leapfrogging can be confused with the idea of cheating or taking a, a route that some people that you shouldn't be taking? How do you differ from a hack? <laughs> Absolutely not. Are you kidding? There are, look, life is like a deck of cards, right? Mm -hmm. You yeah. don't know what hand you're going to get. It's what you do with that hand that defines you. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of people that leapfrog for a variety of different um, for a variety of different reasons in their life. That doesn't make them bad, right? It mm -hmm. just makes them they have they're in a they got a different hand than you did. Maybe they're connected. Yeah. Maybe their parents worked for the company. Maybe their parents' mm -hmm. friends had a connection. I don't know. I, I come from an immigrant family. My mother and yeah. father immigrated to the United States from Quito, Ecuador. They knew nobody. They don't have the connection. They could, you know, my parents couldn't call up and find me an opportunity or find a job. So I yeah. grew up with the front row seat of bootstrapping yourself and creating and making your own destiny. And I'm really glad that they did because it has been so valuable today to be a self-made woman and to bootstrap mm -hmm. yourself and to, and, to, um, and, to, and to be the owner of your own destiny. At the same time, there's nothing wrong with these hacks. I, I love mm -hmm. the fact that women are willing to share their hacks. They're willing to help another woman, right? They're willing to say, hey, this is the way I leapfrogged this situation. Let mm -hmm. me teach you. Let's have a conversation. And I would love that because there are advantages, you know, um, as a result of people's circumstances all over. And I think that's why I think the book is ingenious. I think there's a lot of hacks in there that people may have that they don't want to talk about that they don't know about and i think we need to leapfrog women into running businesses of scale 
less than 2% of women in the United States have a scalable business. We don't have any problem in starting them, but let's help them scale. Can you imagine if we were to take women's potential in the world of entrepreneurship and pull it up? We yeah. would have thousands and millions of people. Yeah, and I think that is a perfect note to wrap this on. That was fantastic. <laughs> Um, I want to thank you again so much for joining me this afternoon. Um, we, to everyone in the comments below, if you have any questions about LeapFrog that you'd like us to ask, let us know. Um, we will be back next week at 1 p.m. Uh, thank you again, Nina, for joining me today. No, and it's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I'm so, again, proud of being part of the LeapFrog book. And if we can help women maximize their potential, then we can help our country. Exactly. Great. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks guys.